Hi, everyone. Welcome to the discussion for chip number 10. This is going to be an owner editable metadata that uh, Josh Painter, who we have had in this meeting, has created. And thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm sorry about the awkward timing for most of you, but we're located on three different continents, so it's hard to make this work out. Uh, we will post this recording publicly for people to view later. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, Josh, you want to start out by introducing yourself? Tell us who you are. Yeah, up to? thanks, Dan. Absolutely. You can hear me okay, right? I can, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, so my name is Josh Painter. Uh, I've been kind of in the Chia community for, uh, well, I guess over a year now. I, I started a month or two after mainnet launch, just farming, and um, earlier this year with the cat launch uh, in January, I started getting into the actual development of it. So uh, we've got about 20 years of, of development experience on other uh, stacks, specifically the Microsoft stack. Um, so it's been quite a, quite a journey for me learning all the fun uh, stuff in Python and, and Chia Lisp and all the other technologies that I have never even seen or heard of over on the, the, the Microsoft side of things. So um, a, lot, a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, this uh, this has been a great experience for me to to learn something new, which I always love, and and then uh, further contribute back uh, if if possible. So that's why we're here, hopefully. Great, thanks, Josh. We always appreciate having you around, and uh, I think many I speak for many of us when I say we really enjoy your tools that you've created. It's a lot of fun to to work on, I'm sure, and I think like. Many people in the community, you seem to enjoy kind of uh, tinkering with new things in a in a way that hasn't really existed for a while in other in other blockchains. So we really appreciate appreciate having you. Well, thank uh, you, well, thank you. Yep. Okay, so let's get into the chip. Uh, so can you explain what it is and what you're uh, going to try to do? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, first of all, is this working? Can you see my editable metadata screenshot here? Yes, I can. Awesome. Okay. So, um, so this is, uh, I, I don't know if, if you or some other audience has seen some of my other happy seedling videos, but this is kind of in the, in the style of happy seedling. Uh, it's not an official happy seedling video, although I may, might, uh, make it one later. This is a little bit more technical than, than my normal audience for, for those videos, but, um, I draw the same way. So, so this will look very similar to, uh, to some of the other videos I've done, but, um, anyway, editable metadata. So, at a high level, do you, do you want me to just jump right in here? Or do you have any other other questions before I start, Dan? Well, we can just jump in, but uh, I guess the only thing that we should tell the audience is that this has to do with NFTs, right? Yes, yes, great point. Absolutely. So let's let's start uh, from that point. We have our NFT one standard out, and you want to add something to that standard. So go ahead. Absolutely. In fact, um, let me just move right along here. Well, that's not working, is it? Let's just go back one and go this way. Speaking of, that's my first slide. Oh, you're way so, ahead of me. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, 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 that's where I wanted to start. Absolutely. So yeah, NFT one standard. Um, so we, this is the standard we all know and love. We're using today. We're we're swapping NFTs on Dexy. We're having a lot of fun. Um, there's a lot of, of course, novel uh, features in this standard that we don't see on other blockchains. Um, the uh, uh, royalty built into the chain, of course, on-chain royalties is a huge deal. That's that's an awesome. Uh, feature that that no other chain provides, as far as we know right now, and and uh, some of the other features too. Uh, one of the ones that really caught my eye when it first popped up was this concept of um, uh, adding alt URIs. So this ability to kind of protect your NFT, uh, specifically, you know, when we first heard about this, it's all about protecting that image, um, so that it doesn't, you know, just because the host or the server that's holding that image, whether even if it's IPFS or some other service, if that service disappears one day, um, it would be nice if we could, you know, add additional URIs as backups um, to those images. So that that in itself, that feature is kind of what uh, at least gave me this uh, idea or started my mind thinking around this idea is what else can we do? with that because that, that's a very interesting concept. Now, of course, it's a kind of a forward only addition. So you can't edit existing URIs or old URIs. You can just add new ones. So that's that's one little caveat. But but you know, what else could we do with that? Is there anything else interesting we could do with just that functionality? Um, so that's kind of where I started. Um, anything else, Dan, do you want to just keep going from there or? Uh, I think so far so good, except 
to throw in one thing with our NFT one standard, these um, there's a URI. Let's let's just make sure everybody understands this. There there's actually three URIs in the NFT standard. There's one for your data, one for which is like your, your image that the NFT is. There's one for the metadata that describes your image. And then there's one for the uh, license. And these are actually lists of URIs. So you can add more links, like you said, I think. Um, however, they in order for wallets to display the NFT properly, the, uh, the what you link to has to hash to a hash that's included inside of the NFT. I hope that makes sense. So with these uh with these metadata uris if you modify any of the metadata later then the hash will change and that won't match the hash that the nft has so the nft won't load or display properly is that pretty much where we're at right now josh yep yep in fact uh, absolutely you I, I should have just shown you this first i think because you're you're just you're moving right along with with my uh my slides here. Oh, so, okay. I'm, so absolutely, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. I should just let you do your thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, that's absolutely great. I'm, I'm glad that we're on the same page for sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So, so absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk more about the, the other uh, types of, of URLs for sure. But, but absolutely, at a high level, this just gives you. You've got this, this fun little thing we call an NFT, and, and at this level, we're just talking about the image. Uh, but of course, as you can see here, we can store it in lots of different places. We can go out to IPFS, uh, AR Weave. Maybe I actually haven't done this. Uh, maybe you even store it on your own server. Why not? Um, the nice thing is, if you see these little red dots here, if if some if one of these services, you know, goes kaput, then um, the viewer is smart enough to just keep trying other URLs until it, it finds the one it wants. Now you also see my fun little uh, DL here. So uh, eventually, we'd love to see NFT images on data layer, of course, too. So that's kind of a future, a future thing. But regardless, the point is, you can have lots of these URLs, uh, URIs, I should say, pointing out to different images. And as Dan said, it works the same for um, uh, uh, the metadata and the licenses as well. But again, the concept here is the hash. So these, these are representing uh, four different links to the exact same image you see here. Um, and of course, if all of these images resolve to the same hash, then, then we're good. Um, the, the point of this, of course, is to have multiple URLs or URIs, I should say, pointing uh, just for backup purposes, mostly for these images. Um, so yeah, so moving right along now, we can actually kind of look at a, a, an actual example here. Um, this, if, you, if you're familiar with the, uh, <clears throat> the GoForMe service where you just kind of send your XCH address to the GoForMe bot on Twitter, it will give you this fun little, uh, your Twitter username as a subdomain and then dot GoForMe slash, well, that's just your main site. And that site shows you your fun little uh, username PFP here, which is just your Twitter username that you've got. Um, and if you actually look behind the scenes, there's a, it's actually a, a PNG that we render here. So we actually render this in real time and then, and then give you this URL that will eventually go on the NFT. So these aren't real NFTs yet. These are just the images I'm working on so far. But this is just an example of that concept where you would, if we zoom in on the URL, this is kind of what you would expect. You would have the, the server and then you would have probably the image file. Now, some, some of like, like IPFS actually don't even have a, a file name. They just have literally a link. But but you get the idea. This is kind of a breakdown of a normal, a normal URL. Um, moving along now, of course, we also have the metadata, and um, I don't actually get into the license uh, file, but that's actually a good point, Dan. I totally kind of missed or forgot about that part. But the the interesting part here that we're going to talk about all revolves around the metadata, editable metadata. So, metadata links point to usually uh, JSON files. I mean, they can point to really anything, but in our case, uh, in our chip zero zero. Seven standard, we've got a nice uh, metadata standard for this this domain .json, or this JSON file that you might use for your uh, NFT metadata. So most of our NFTs uh, point to similar JSON files that look like this. You'll see a bunch of stuff at the top that specifies the chip standard and all of that, the collection details down here. But right here in the middle, you'll see a lot of these attributes. Um, uh, and actually, these are trait types. Uh, we'll see this later as the actual standards. But you basically have name value pairs um in these attributes in this case we have a name that says intertown and the xeh attribute points to this xeh address uh, just as an example so this is we're just kind of showing what metadata this json file might actually um, contain so uh, again these json files just like the uh, image files you can have multiple uh, uris in the um, nft pointing to different metadata 
Uh, and again, all of this has to be the exact same, just like the image. That file has to render the exact same JSON, uh, no matter where it's hosted. Uh, and down to the, you know, it has to actually resolve the exact same hash uh, as well that you've put in the, uh, the NFT when you minted it. So none of that's different, uh, but it just does give you a, another uh, URI uh, field on your NFT. Um, and this is for the metadata. So that's kind of what we take advantage of here in this little, this little fun trick. Um, if you think about it though, at a, at a very high level, what's happening, if you're looking at an NFT in your, in your Chia client or any other NFT viewer, um, really the, that viewer itself is doing two things. It's gonna go out and it's gonna load the image somehow from somewhere. It's gonna check the hash, do all that good stuff, make sure it's good. It's going to do the same thing for the JSON file. Uh, go out and load that from, from one of those URIs and check the hash and make sure that's all good. And then it's going to show you the image here and it's going to load up all those attributes down here at the bottom and those little, uh, you know, when you're looking at the details of your NFT. So you basically have the image plus the JSON gives you this nice view of what the NFT is right now. Um, and that's just, you know, the basic how these two kind of URL and, uh, I'm sorry, the image and the JSON work together. Um, now, again, Dan mentioned the license, which is actually a third uh, thing out here, and that actually includes the license that can also be shown as a URI here. I don't mention that here because we don't really need it for this particular place, uh, but that's a good point. There's, so there's actually three of these different types of URI fields that you can, um, that, that, that function similar to this, okay? So now we're going to get to the actual fun bit. Before I do, any questions? Dan, everything okay so far? It seems... This so far, so it's good. been a beautiful demo. This is great. Okay, okay, okay. Well, we haven't got to the fun bit. This is the fun bit now. All oh, right. wow. <laughs> so the fun bit. Yeah, this is, this is all just, uh, just lead up to other stuff. Okay, so the fun bit. Um, what are we actually going to do here? Well, we're actually going to... What's interesting about URLs is if you look on any URL in your browser, there's also a part that we're, we're missing that we haven't talked about yet, which is called the query stream. And this is the, there's a question mark at the end of the URL um, and then there's a bunch of gobbledygook after that usually. Those are our name value pairs. Um, and these are what normal websites use to kind of pass data around. Now, they're not as used as much these in this day and age. This day and age, we use all kinds of different fancy routing and paths and, and where it kind of looks like these variables are in subdirectories and all kinds of fancy tricks. But in the old days, we just used pure query strings, which is a question mark and then a name value pair. And, and we loaded up that data uh, and the web server did something unique with that data. Um, so what you might have, and this will start looking more familiar now, if we look back at that example of the, uh, the, the PNG earlier, if we just add question mark XEH equals and then a, a value, what's gonna happen? Uh, let's say that we actually added this as one of our new URLs into that, uh, into that NFT uh, using this, this feature of, of the NFT1 standard. Will this still work? Well, sure, the, the server is actually still gonna give you that same PNG from the server. It's just gonna ignore whatever you put after this. It doesn't care. This, this is uh, every server I've ever tried this little trick with that just is used to serving PNGs. Uh, will just ignore whatever you put in the question mark afterwards. So the server doesn't care. It's still gonna serve you the exact same file, um, which is gonna have the exact same hash as always. So for all intents and purposes, up to this point, the server is just gonna ignore this extra question mark at the end. And, but that's great for our purposes. We don't, we don't really want it to do anything uh, different. We want to still get the same file. Um, moving on, same thing for the JSON. Um, same concept, right? So the JSON, it's gonna, uh, uh, here's an example to a domain.json file or any sort of metadata JSON. Again, if you put a question mark at the end of it, uh, the server is just gonna say, I don't know what that means. I've never seen question marks when you ask for files, I don't care. I'll just send you the normal JSON file like I always have. It has the same hash and you do with it whatever you want. So again, the server, wherever that's loading this JSON file from is just going to ignore all this extra stuff that we put on this URL. Okay, so again, we can kind of use this to our advantage. So what if now we, um, we had the, so we have the image, the, the back to the Chia viewer, it's gonna load up the image first, of course. It's gonna load up the JSON from one of those uh, URI sources, the metadata. Uh, but what if it also was able to say, hey, what if there's a, a value on this query string? Maybe I should use that value instead of what I see in the JSON file. Okay, so in this case, the JSON file had a value of, of this thing called XCH and the query string, the latest URI that was added to this NFT also has an XCH value on its query stream. So the viewer that knows about chip 10 
0010 will know to uh, automatically override the value that it considers the current value of that metadata with the one off the query string. Um, so that, that's basically the whole concept behind the trick here of how this all works. Um, we're just basically stuffing some extra values. Uh, and these are going to be small values usually. These aren't going to be scads of data, of course. Um, the other nice thing about this sort of thing, I shouldn't say nice, the, uh, I, the specific use case that this would be appropriate for would be data that changes relatively rarely because, you know, adding a URI to your NFT doesn't cost a huge amount in fees that, by design, but adding SCADs and SCAD of query screen data after it might start getting expensive. So um, you certainly wouldn't want to use this trick for da big data or data that changes often even um, going forward in a, in a healthier fee market. Um, but, you know, for small data that doesn't change that often and only should be changeable by the owner of the current NFT, which is kind of a neat little trick too, by the way. Um, of course, as you know, only the owner can update the or add to the list of, of URIs. So these editable values uh, by design can only be updated by the current owner, whoever currently holds the NFT. Um, so for my little example here of pointing to an XH address, it's, it's perfect, of course, because the owner should be able to change where their username points uh, if, if we're just using like an XCH pointer service, for example, in this case. Um, so that's the basic trick. Uh, any questions at that level before we get into the actual kind of uh, technical bit of it. Does that seem, does that make sense? Makes sense to me. Does anybody else have questions? Okay, cool. Guess not. All good. So. Cool. Okay, so that's what, the, so this will, this will be one of my questions at the end. I, I have kind of a list of my own questions actually to specifically for, for Dan and maybe the, the rest of the group, but um, uh, this to me more extends chip 007, the off-chain metadata format, of course, uh, rather than supplants it or, or uh, you know, uh, upgrades it. I'm not, I'm not really sure the terminology or, or what, but I'm looking for feedback on that. I'm not sure that they, if they coexist at the same time or if this one upgrades that one or if they both work the same, like in this kind of, you know, maybe we would have this, it's, it's seven plus 10 equals this, but that aside for now, naming, naming nomenclature aside, um, what I, th this is the cool part. So the only thing we add to chip 007 uh, from the technical perspective is this new uh, attribute. So if you look at the chip 007, it describes these, these trait types. So uh, an NFT has a trait type, and then you can have a string value there, whatever you want to call it. And then you have a value. And of course, that can be your, your text value. Uh, this chip to so Tin basically just proposes adding a single editable uh, attribute to that those list of values called true, and in this case, the new the NFT viewer that knows about chip uh, chip chip tin would now know to say, okay, I will as I'm parsing these values. If I see one that says editable equals true, that means I need to go look at the the most recent uh, URI for the metadata, and if this same uh, trait type name is on the query string. So whatever that is. And then we have, you know, XCH, whatever that is. Um, if we find this on the query, on the latest URI, this the same value, then we use that value instead of the one we find inside this metadata. Um, so it's really just a, a flag to the viewer that says, hey, uh, this is the, the, the creator of this NFT decided that this value is editable by the owner. And in that case, to find the latest value that the owner has, has pushed to the chain, you need to go look at the latest URI instead of what's actually inside this. Now, if there's nothing on that URI or in the history of the URIs, then of course it could fall back on the value that's, that's right there in the, in the metadata. So that's very simple from the, from the technological point of it. Always, um, you know, it, it's backwards compatible, of course, no big deal there. Um, we can add this rather than uh, to, to all of the existing uh, uh, schemas out there. No big deal there. Um, even this should be parsable by older uh, uh, Chip 07 parsers. In fact, they'll just probably ignore this. I'm not sure exactly what their implementation is, of course. But the idea is it's, it's, it's pretty much as backwards compatible with what we have out there as, as it can be. Um, so that was, that was also important, of course. Um, so, 
just quickly, we'll break down how the loading logic would work. I already basically talked about this, but but all viewers that subscribe to this new new chip would need to um, number one load the metadata attributes. They've always done this. Load it from the latest JSON that they have. In most cases, the latest uh, JSON file that they can get off the server, and then of course they would look at those attributes and look for that new editable attribute on each one. If they found one that was true, then they would know that they should go look at the query stream that it found on the latest one and use that value uh, instead of the value that it found in the JSON. So logic from the viewer side, relatively simple for just, just seeing these things. Um, now, saving is kind of interesting too. So you can imagine uh, because these are just editing URIs, we could actually kind of hide that almost from the viewer. The viewer doesn't necessarily need to know that these are URIs even. They're, they're just trying to update stuff, right? So you can imagine a UI in the future that might have little pencil icons next to the editable attributes uh, that the uh, metadata specifies. And when you click that pencil icon, it, it pops a little uh, window that lets you create a new, or specify a new value. Of course, this is an on-chain transaction, so it's gonna ask you for the fee. Uh, and then, of course, it'll go out and update that URI for you um, using the same transaction that the CLI would do. Um, and the user wouldn't know the difference. All of a sudden, their value would change. And, and to them, they just edited something on the, on the NFT. So that's a really nice, nice little user experience. Um, that was inside the, the, the uh, Chia wallet or, or even any sort of Chia wallet. This could actually work on the website itself, of course, too. So. You can imagine websites integrated with Adobe. Um, same thing, they could have a little a viewer on the website. Imagine like a mint garden type of site here. Uh, and a button that says, hey, you can edit these. Um, just click Gobi. That's gonna launch the Gobi sign request, which only you know the owner of this NFT could sign possibly. So they're gonna sign that request to make that spin bundle that updates the URI. And, um, and this is all without even having to have a wallet installed locally, uh, just the Gobi app. So that would be another possibility of editing this metadata. Uh, and then finally, of course, we've got the good old CLI. So um, this is all just normal CLI work from that perspective. As long as you get the, uh, the query strings right, you can add your own directly uh, using scripts or any other fun stuff um, that, that might be might come along in the future. Okay, so that about wraps up my presentation. Now I do have some questions I wanna run through quickly and then we'll get to, I think everybody else's questions, but just, um, and some of these may be for more Dan on the, on the process, but um, just quickly. So this, this is what I alluded to earlier. Do we, does this replace 07, extend it? Do they look for, do viewers look for chip 10 now instead of seven, or do they just look for those editable attributes? Maybe that's just, maybe this just becomes part of chip seven, uh, like a V2. I, I'm not sure how that works. Um, some other interesting things that, that has come up. Uh, so just already in some discussions, um, some attributes might be, some of the existing standards that we know about in 07, such as the name of the actual NFT, we could in this update, go ahead and say that's just editable all the time. You don't even have to put an editable attribute on that. Um, we could also perhaps add a different field for that, call it nickname. And this lets the user always give whatever name they want to every NFT they own in Chia. Um, so we could, we could actually add this feature even to existing uh, NFTs by, by making this part of the standard to say, hey, if the viewer sees this name field on the query string, regardless, um, or nickname, perhaps, then go ahead and use that as the name. Um, that's a little more aggressive uh, use of this standard, of course, not, not nearly as backwards compatible, but, but might give some interesting uh, new features going forward. Uh, same thing for the notes field. So this this was another idea I had around provenance, and I, I thought it was such a fun idea to uh, for all NFTs just to have a notes field. And of course, uh, this gets back to kind of you know we don't want to stuff a whole lot of data on the chain, but you can imagine a notes field that you you just put like you know I got this uh, the day Ethereum crashed. I don't, you know I don't know like you 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 put some funny little story of when you got this NFT or how you got it. And then that actually goes on chain and is carried forward in the provenance to the next collector who can now either uh, blank this out and put in their own story or add to it, you know, and keep going. But regardless, uh, even if they blank it out and put in their own, of course, it's all in the history, right? It would be in the old URI that's on the chain. So you would still, your viewer could still go back in time and look at these, these notes that people have put on the chain over time 
And I think that would be kind of just a fun little thing to add anyway to the to the NFTs, just as a, a neat thing. And this this would enable that uh, with just this kind of notes query string. But so anyway, that's my whole spiel. Now, uh, actual questions. So here's where I will. Uh, 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 anybody is free to ask questions, comments, etc. I'm going to take notes. I'm going to try to um, try to just see what see what people have, what ideas people have. Thanks, Josh. Anybody have questions? Yeah, first of all, thanks, Josh, for the great demo. I really like the art style, so and and you explained <laughs> it very you. nicely. Um, did you did you look into uh, the blockchain cost? What it would uh, mean? No, to I add uh, things. I have not actually done that. That's a great point. So, what would it actually be uh, for? Uh, like. Uh, yeah, different lengths of URLs. So that, that's yeah, a great but, point. Yes, uh, uh, that um, since you're only adding stuff to the NFT um, URIs, um, it's n even though it is all in the history, all the history is always all, also in the newest coin. So the coin gets bigger and bigger. Uh, whenever you change one of those values. And it's not only getting bigger by the thing you're changing, but also by the rest of the, uh, the, the thing before the query string, basically, so the normal uh, URI. Right. <clears throat> so um, gotcha. yeah, it's, it's basically coming down to how much uh, cost does this bring? Um, and how often can I change things before uh, my NFT blows up the block. Yeah, that's and, a great point. And uh, that is something I did not know for sure. Sorry. Well you, well, you kind of alluded to it, Josh, when in your demo where you said you, you don't want to use a really long query string. That's, that's sure. the reason sure. why. Um, and maybe I can Well, I, I, I didn't know that. I, oh, sorry. No, I can I can hook you up with a link to um, our cost documentation. I think you have to add on I think it's 12,000 cost per byte. And then there's some other costs too. So you can maybe do some research on that and just get a good feel for it. My initial guess is if you add something small, like just change the name of something just once, then it's, it's probably negligible. But as, you, as uh, Andreas pointed out, as you add more, it's, it's going to be quite a bit more costly. And keep in mind, that is you, interesting. Could, you could eventually essentially not quite brick an NFT, but make it unspendable if you make it larger than the, the cost larger than an entire block can even absorb you could like it would be very hard to even um sell the nft at that point if you got really really big right i mean right, i guess right. yep. you can you can always just burn the nft if you wanted to destroy it so um i guess the the malintent is not not too, too too much of an issue here but um yes if you are not paying attention and um adding stuff and adding stuff and adding stuff then it will um it could be uh, larger than uh, the, the, the maximum cost of a block. Yes, uh, there is one other uh, caveat though to, to point out is that it, this is already possible in the current NFT standard. That is an issue, or not an issue, but it is something we thought of where if you add say a thousand links, you will, might start getting the exact same problem today. Mm, good point, good point. Yep. So it's kind of, it is, it's the same concern that we have already, but I'm, I'm, ab I'm abusing a feature a bit to, to make that a bit of a bitter, bigger concern possibly. I, I think it's a, a good way to say that because, because yeah, you, you, it wouldn't be a concern if, if normally you just need to have backups to maybe four or five different endpoints to back up your images. But uh, once you start using this to actually edit things, if, if you're editing lots and lots of things, I, you, I did not know that. I actually assumed, and this is where I should have, uh, I should read, learn to read Chilas uh, even deeper. Um, I assumed that it almost like a, like a slug trail, you know, like each URL got added at each time. And, and you know, it kind of like, you could look at the, the history over time to, to gather up the list if you needed to, but you're saying it actually brings it along every time, right? Like, so it's like, yeah. It's like one um, and then two and then three and then four, four, four. Yeah, okay. It becomes part of the NFT itself. And you can think of it like we recommend that you do not actually put your image on the blockchain for this exact reason too, because it, of it course, is embedded of course. in the coin itself. And as the coin 
accumulates more bytes, it becomes more expensive in terms of CLVM cost and potentially could get really difficult to spend. Makes sense, makes sense. Okay, so so this would be good then. So is any sort of, uh, if I can come up with, so cost, not only cost, but also at what point do we start getting uh, silly? You know, can we edit something a thousand times, a uh, hundred times? I mean, you know, I think those kind of numbers would be would be good to know just at a general level. Yeah, I think I think as this chip goes forward, you should you should just put in some recommendations, and it's not that you can't do the chip. It's just you you should give people an awareness of what's going to happen if they add a ton of data or how much is too much, and we can help yep. with that too. Yep. You almost I, I almost imagine like uh, like uh, SSD endur endurance. <laughs> this kind of reminds. It's almost like okay, this NFT has you know so many rights you can do to it before before you need to kind of replace it or throw it away or do so. You know. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of the same result. Like <laughs> yeah, different way of getting there, but same result. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Right. This gets bigger and bigger until it's uh, un unusable. I mean, imagine uh, you anyway, have a hard. Okay. Yeah, I love that. Imagine you have a hard drive that, I mean, it only can store so much. So if you fill it up, eventually it'll overflow. <laughs> and yep. and if, it just, just to, and it, to, to think about it, um, the normal add your eye to NFT with the ID spend has a cost of around 70 million. And uh, in 70 million cost, <clears throat> It's around um, if you if you want to let's say the same cost um, in um, in the, the amount of data you want to put in it's about six kilobytes so every um, six kilobytes you add is around the same cost or adding additional cost to to that um, to that spend yeah that sounds about right to me yeah. That's and not it's horrible always if we're talking spot. about simple name value pairs. Excuse me? Sorry. Right. I, I just said that's that's not horrible if we're just talking about a simple name value pairs for, for 6K. Nah, that's, it's, that's quite a bit of, a bit of storage. A couple kilobytes, uh, you, can, you can update uh, a lot of things a lot of times. I mean, your yeah. entire JSON file is probably less than that to begin with, so you could replace everything. Yeah, in fact, um, you know, this is actually a great... Uh, I assume, so I, I saw some of the cool stuff names Dow has been doing recently with the DID, some of the uh, JSON and the metadata of the DID. I, but I, I suppose th would this, would that concern, would this concern be the same there that, that you could kind of inflate that metadata on your DID coin over time as well? Is that, is that true? Yes, yeah, definitely the case. Okay. So one of one of the things I did I did think about early on with this concept because of course uh, that it seems like uh, the DID metadata is going to be a really fun spot to, to store things as well right with any of this sort of things, but what I liked about this is that you were able to more granularly um, you know in other words each NFT could actually have different values on them, um, so you could have lots of different NFTs and then you'd only have to edit one or two of them for certain values versus editing the huge field on your DID when you just need to edit one or two things inside it. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. So, yeah, that, that's, uh, that, was, uh, that was one of the, the things I was thinking through as well. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I definitely didn't know about this little fun fact. So that is a thing to keep in mind, and I'll, I'll need to look deeper into that for sure. Um, one of the things, too, that John mentioned, he wasn't able to be here, uh, John from from uh, Chi Links was the, uh, of course the the, uh, whoops the um, query string. Whoops, oh no, sorry, going back to screen on the wrong one. I'm going to do a queue there. <laughs> the uh, query string standards. So obviously, I'm just using the normal URL URL, I believe, standards for query strings. Um, but I need to put something in there specifically that, that mentions that uh, you know uh, URL encoding and all that fun stuff. Um, so how, how we would manage that, but that's just all pretty much the basic stuff. There. So cool. Uh, anything else? I think that's, that's great feedback. Great. So, uh, unfortunately because of this meet this, um, snafu with, with the, uh, zoom link, I, I'm going to have to wrap it up. I only have two minutes left. Uh, Chunk, you have a question? Yeah, I've got a bit of a, it's a bit of a dumb question, but I'll be quick with it. Um, 
for uh, trade values that have uh, non-unique names. So if they if it's the same, if it's the same name for the trait value, are we going to deal with them sequentially, or is it not allowed? I haven't done my homework. Mm, that's a good so question. I'm not sure how that would same, be. Yeah. So uh, like now, if you had two attributes of the same name in the same JSON file already, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. So if they were both editable, and um, yeah, the trait value was one two three. Sorry, the trait type was one two three. And the value was whatever editable yes and then another one exactly the same trait type one two three but perhaps a different value editable yes as well would you deal with them sequentially within the query string that is a great okay. question i'm gonna write that down um that's a yeah because you can definitely there are standards for multiple values in query strings so that's a great great point i'll i'll, I'll catch that before we die here on our zoom meeting but uh, great question yeah. and that should definitely be part of the, the chip and yeah. otherwise uh, i'm gonna have to direct you to uh, ask all of your questions on our uh, discourse channel. And I'm going to put a link to that in, in Keybase and we should all keep in touch on any, any more questions, issues, comments on this chip. And this is just the beginning. It's now open for discussion. Um, please leave your formal reviews on, on uh, GitHub on the initial chip. And I want to thank Josh for coming out and, and everybody else for coming on. And it's been a great presentation. I really Thanks, appreciate Dan. you doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everybody else, too. Really great feedback. That's what I was here for. Thank you, Josh. It. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Keep the feedback coming. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye.